book because it's probably the one topic about aging that we know the least about. People honestly haven't spent a lot of time taking apart and studying older people that are actually happy and older people that are actually feel like they've been successful at the aging process. Um, we've obviously spent a lot of time talking about what can go wrong. Um, and there's really not a lot of room to talk about what goes right, um, which is why I'm always interested in this last one. The past couple of years, we've been saving this topic for the last interview project, so it works just like the last one, but I, some of you have already turned it in. So um, one last go around of fighting your old person um, and picking their brain about successful aging. Um, works just like the other ones, transcript in the Dropbox, and then the discussion forum has some questions. And really, you would be thinking, due date, let's, I mean, Sunday, right? Sunday meant just like, I know this is the end of live classes, but um, Sunday has been like perfectly fine. We look at our overview, what we got coming up. Uh, this is the last time that I'll see you. I mean, usually it's like, hey, last class, I'll see you Tuesday at 10 o'clock or some weird time to meet for our final exam, but we're not doing that this semester. The final exam will just be out there be out there and it'll be waiting for you um, starting tomorrow until Sunday. So at your leisure, whenever you feel like you're ready, just like the first two exams, go ahead and tackle that. It'll be Thursday until Sunday. So the final chapter in your book, short and sweet on successful aging. Um, in fact, we make it even shorter because there's a part of creativity that we kind of kind of go don't go over. Um, your older person, the interview project. Um, and yeah, so of course about if you want to do course of L, that's perfectly fine. I'm supposed to say that out loud my contract remind them about course of health. Even though I think about 30% of people do it. it. That's like a good semester. 30% of people do course of health, which actually personally for me is just fine because I don't find course of health very helpful at all. Um, what I do find helpful though and what I would appreciate, even though you don't have to do it, I can't make you do it. Um, and I can't even do something like give you extra credit for it or anything like that because it's actually anonymous. If you would, if you remember, if you have time, I would appreciate this. There's a little link to an anonymous survey monkey course review. It looks just like this. I won't know who you are, um, which is good because that means you can be as brutally honest as possible. Um, if, no, it's really just about what worked, what didn't. Um, obviously, this is bizarre. I've never taught this class in any type of hybrid form whatsoever. So if you couldn't tell, uh, some weeks we're just kind of making it up as we go along. Um, but no, I hope you got something out of it. It's kind of what this is about. So if you remember, there's just like five questions, um, one of which is a slider to rate your course. Look at that. Nobody um, could just do that. Any questions? No? All right, well, let's talk about um, things that we need to talk about. Um, and then I'll show you, we're going to watch, I wouldn't call it like the most important TED talk. That's a little too profound. Um, but it's an, it is an important one. Has anyone ever heard of the Harvard Longitudinal Study of Adult Development? You don't need to write that down. No? So we'll get into this. This will be at the tail end. The Harvard Longitudinal Study of Adult Development is the longest running study ever done on human beings. And it's still going. I once worked with a lady at, Ohio, at the Ohio State University. I once worked with a lady who was studying attachment in kids. And she followed a group of kids for 25 years, from when they were born until age 25. I thought that was long. This study's been going on now for about 82 years. Um, it started way back, um, and it's been following the same group of people for decades, and now they're following that group of people's kids. Over it started with like 724 people, and now it's up to like 3,000 and stuff. Like it just keeps growing, and who knows how long it's going to keep going. But we'll save that for last. So successful aging. What do we know about it? Well. We actually start in such a not so good place. We have this myth, right, that older people are not that happy. That older, we, we, so now we're circling all the way back to week one, day one of this class. Those myths that we went over, that happiness probably goes down as we get older, that people like to be isolated. A lot of those myths comes from a study that had really good intentions. 1998, that's not that long ago. You, you weren't alive, but you were almost alive. This is literally when the ball got kicked off of studying successful aging by two people named Rowan Kahn. 
And they defined successful aging in a really kind of broad, vague way. Interestingly enough, not by asking people, they just kind of came up with it on their own. They said three things you need. So think of a Venn diagram, and you got to be where they all connect to be successful. The first part is you have to be absent of any disease or disability. Okay. That's kind of a big one. That's actually a big ask. I mean, as we get older, our risk for disease and some kind of disability gets greater and greater and greater. So right there, that's a pretty exclusive category. They also said you need to show high cognitive skills. Okay, let's not. Hopefully we have that. Then this other broad kind of vague one category they said is you need to be highly engaged socially in your life. Then they went out, I guess maybe to places like Copeland Oaks. And they were curious, well, how many people who are older, and by, like, I think they defined older by like 70, some kind of random number, 70 and up. I guess I wrote it over there too. We start with the number 19. According to Rowan Kahn, only about 19% of older people are actually successful at the aging process. One person who actually doesn't fit their category is kind of famous. I started on my first live sitcom, which was Life of Elizabeth. And of course, back then, we didn't want to do it live. We just didn't know how to take things. <laughs> so I don't know what this show's excuse is. <laughs> you know, I have so many people to thank for being here, but I really have to thank Facebook. <laughs> the campaign to get me a whole Saturday Night Live, I didn't know what Facebook was. <laughs> and now that I do know what it is, I have to say, it sounds like a huge waste of time. <laughs> yeah. I would never say that people on it are losers, <laughs> but that's only because I'm polite. <laughs> People say, but Betty, Facebook is a great way to connect with old friends. Well, at my age, if I want to connect with old friends, I need a read you more. <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't have Facebook when I was growing up. We had both, but you wouldn't waste an afternoon. <laughs> Facebook just sounds like a brag. In my day, Seeing pictures of people's vacations was considered a punishment. <laughs> and when we were kids, we didn't say we were single. We were just kids. It was weird if you weren't single. <laughs> yes, we had poking, but it wasn't something you did on a computer. <laughs> it was something you did on a hayride. <laughs> Under a blanket. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Things were a lot different when I was growing up. My father, Horace, was a traveling salesman who moved our family to California during the Great Depression. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you only read about in novels. And to think 
I lived through a world war, worked on radio and films on Mary Tyler Moore and the Golden Girls. <laughs> And now I'm here tonight because you wanted me to be. I really just want to say I feel so loved. Thank you. If I could, I would I would take you all on a big hayride. <laughs> Starting with you, sir. No, not you. <laughs> you. <clears throat> Guess what? Jay-Z is here! If I, had, if I had a guy coming up and said that, I'd have one guy. There wasn't anything to shake a stick at in my day. We have a great show for you tonight. So stick around, and we'll be right back. I would say Betty White's pretty successful. If you didn't know, yeah, there was a Facebook campaign to get her on the show. At the ripe old age of 88, but she would not actually fit their model of successful aging, just to show you how kind of how ridiculous that is, and mainly because of the DND. She has several disabilities, um, and she's also not free of disease. So just taking that one out would seem to suggest maybe people are a lot more successful than we give them credit for, and maybe we're just looking at the right thing. So the idea with Rowan Khan, again, but the problem is it became famous. I know you've never heard of this. You've never probably heard the, the words Rowan Khan put together. But if you're in the field of human development, it was like a big deal. And it, and it really spread a lot of the myths that we have about older people just simply being kind of miserable individuals. Over in Europe, they were doing their own study. It became known as the SHARE study. They studied 53,000 older individuals. And by older, they actually made it a lot younger, 50 plus. By the way, you can get into Copeland Oaks when you turn 55. So they adjusted the age a little bit. Um, they expanded the idea of what social engagement could be. In other words, you didn't have to have a big social network of friends. And in their study, they I guess it got a little bit better. They found that about 40% of people in Europe were defined as successful agents. But if they only zoomed in on one aspect, they ended up pointing what they called super agers. Get rid of this. If we removed the disease and disability, and we zoomed in on Sorry, that's why I got rid of it. Probably talking it down. Two really important factors: high cognitive functioning and a high level of social engagement that we let the older person themselves define. About eighty percent of individuals turn out to be successful aging. So it's highly likely the person that you talk to, who's sixty-five plus, will say they feel like they've aged successfully. But the people that we know who say that, that we call superagers, it actually is, irregardless of disease or disability and what you're going to watch next, will help maybe explain that. <clears throat> but the absolute most important factor is the cognitive, the cognitive functioning. If someone has that, despite anything else, they typically define themselves as being successful, up to 80%. Which got a new term coined, the paradox of well-being. And the paradox of well-being is that most individuals who are in, in older age think of themselves as successful agers, and they see themselves as relatively happy. But many of them are trapped in bodies that can no longer do everything that they want to do. I was in Walmart the other day. I find myself there way too often. And I saw this little guy who looked, he just he didn't look happy. Um, he had a Mount Union hat on, he had a Mount Union mask on. I'm assuming this guy has some kind of ties to the university. And he's in his little jazzy, just going really slow. And he just didn't look, he just didn't look happy. Um, 
And then, of course, I'm thinking of this stuff in my head, and I just stop, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, did you go to Mount Union? I thought it'd be a nice approach, other than say, like, did you retire or whatever? I just asked him, and, and suddenly his little eyes like like lit up. Um, and I didn't ask him to get up, but he just starts getting on his chest and holding himself up in the aisle. <laughs> and he's like, I'm 92 years old. I'm like, that's awesome. And then he's like, he's like, I did go. And then he was like, guess when I was there? And I'm like, I, I have no like like 1950s. And he's like, when I was there, Chapman Hall was still being built. Of course, he's kidding. It's Chapman Hall. And then he starts laughing out loud. I had like a 20 minute conversation with this guy. He's totally, totally happy. But he's a perfect example of this. It's a paradox of well being. He's happy. He loves his life. But he's trapped in this 92 year old body that now requires a jazzy to get some cream corn from Walmart, which is what he was looking for. Um, so the paradox of well being. So I guess the question for you guys, I would ask. And now we're getting to the Harvard study of adult development. You can just shout it out loud. What is it? What will it take for you to be successful? Yeah, that's how I know. That's how it looks like Hogwarts, doesn't it? But that's Harvard. Wouldn't that be great if that's what your dining hall looked like? You'd still be unhappy. Jeremy, you serve the same pizza every day. Yeah, but look at the light. Actually, let me ask this in a different way, because I, I do this with my freshmen almost every year, if I remember to do it. When we ask freshmen that come to the University of Mount Union, and I ask them a very simple question, what will it take for you to be successful later on in life? Because I think that's a pretty important question, right? If you want to invest in something, right, you want to invest in the right things, right, so it grows. I think we all want to be successful when we're 90. So how do you get there? What's, what's the right thing to go after now, because now is the time to do it, because you're still you're still like 21. I remember what that was like. I mean, there's still time for me too. It's running out. So when we ask freshmen, there's two things that always come, and this this talk will mention it in a couple minutes. But it's like clockwork. The freshmen say this, and it kind of brings a little tear to my eyes. My God, you guys, you have no idea. But what do you think they say when freshmen come in? So I'm not picking on you. What are the two things they say will make them successful? Money. Absolutely. 80% of people say money. Definitely number one. And, that, and that, why are you here? Well, to get a good job. Well, what kind of job do you want that makes me lots of money? That's their goal. They don't really care what the job is as long as it makes them lots and lots and lots of money because that's important. But what else do they say? There's a number two, which I guess is kind of tied to it. Famous. They want to be rich and they want to be famous. And they don't want to be famous. I mean, and being famous, I guess that's a goal if you want to like accomplish something. Like, I want to be the fastest marathoner in the world. That's never happening. But here's the funny thing they don't want to be famous for some kind of like meaningful reason. They just want to be famous, like Kardashian famous. Like, they just for like they have a brand. Like, they want to be a what do they call it? an influencer or like someone on youth, right? They want to have the viral video that makes them instantly famous. And that's so, which of course, the reason they want that money <laughs> because fame, right? Brings, so they want notoriety and they want fame and nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to what's the right thing to actually invest in. So here's some things to write down. Then I'll shut up and hit play. And we'll see if it changes your life. I want to get this, these facts out of the way. So the Harvard study of adult development, it's now being, it's now over 80 years old. I believe it's on its 82nd year. And right away, you'll see the video is a few years old. I think at the time this was made, it's like year 78 or something like that. The original cohort of people that this study followed was 724 men. Now, ladies, don't worry. You do get included eventually, but... This was back in the 30s and the 40s when this started. The fun thing, you don't need to write this next part down, the fun thing about this study is it really wasn't aimed at anything in particular. They just wanted to study people and how they grew over time. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't have really any like set expectations or biases. They literally just wanted to watch individuals over the years. And see what happens. There are now 60 people left in the original cohort, 
That's it. Out of 724. So less than 10% of them are still alive. And all of them that are still alive today are well into their 90s. Here's the interesting thing. and I'm glad they had the foresight to do this. There were two very distinct groups that they followed. The first group were sophomores at, you guessed it, Harvard. Okay, really that's who we're following? Because there's one thing you should, right, we can all guess. Oh, so these are extremely wealthy white males. Great. <laughs> what, a, what a fun bunch of people to study. They've got all the privileges in the world. They've got everything just handed to them. But wait, the second group was entirely different. The second group, on purpose, were young boys from the slums of inner city Boston, some of the poorest of the poor neighborhoods, with no advantages. So two very different starting points. And it turns out when it comes to happiness and success, these two groups share a common denominator when they figured out what it was. And this is, I guess, somewhat important, but every two years they would study these people. And it wasn't just sitting down for an interview like, hey, Dante, it's, a, it's 2012, it's time for your interview. No, they took these individuals' blood. They studied their relationships. They talked to their relatives. This checkup every two years would actually last more than a day because they would do a full physical, a whole full body workout. They would do cognitive testing. So it's like every two years you've got studied inside and out every aspect of your life. From your physical health to your mental health to your social health. And they just kept following these individuals. And here's what happened. What keeps us healthy and happy as we go through life? If you were going to invest now in your future best self, where would you put your time and your energy? There was a recent survey of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were. And over 80% said that a major life goal for them was to get rich. And another 50% of those same young adults said that another major life goal was to become famous. And we're constantly told to lean in to work, to push harder and achieve more. We're given the impression that these are the things that we need to go after in order to have a good life. Pictures of entire lives of the choices that people make and how those choices work out for them, those pictures are almost impossible to get. Most of what we know about human life, we know from asking people to remember the past. And as we know, hindsight is anything but 2020. We forget vast amounts of what happens to us in life. And sometimes memory is downright creative. But what if we could watch entire lives as they unfold through time? What if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way into old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy? We did that. The Harvard study of adult development may be the longest study of adult life that's ever been done. For 75 years, we've tracked the lives of 724 men. Year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course, asking all along the way without knowing how their life stories were going to turn out. Studies like this are exceedingly rare. Almost all projects of this kind fall apart within a decade because too many people drop out of the study, or funding for the research dries up, or the researchers get distracted, or they die, and nobody moves the ball further down the field. But through a combination of luck and the persistence of several generations of researchers, this study has survived. About 60 of our original 724 men 
are still alive, still participating in the study, most of them in their 90s. And we are now beginning to study the more than 2,000 children of these men. And I'm the fourth director of the study. Since 1938, we've tracked the lives of two groups of men. The first group started in the study when they were sophomores at Harvard College. They all finished college during World War II, and then most went off to serve in the war. And the second group that we followed was a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods. Boys who were chosen for the study specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s. Most lived in tenements, many without hot and cold running water. When they entered the study, all of these teenagers were interviewed, they were given medical exams, we went to their homes and we interviewed their parents. And then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life. They became factory workers and lawyers and bricklayers and doctors, one president of the United States. Some developed alcoholism, a few developed schizophrenia. Some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the very top and some made that journey in the opposite direction. The founders of this study would never in their wildest dreams have imagined that I would be standing here today, 75 years later, telling you that the study still continues. Every two years, our patient and dedicated research staff calls up our men and asks them if we can send them yet one more set of questions about their lives. Many of the inner city Boston men ask us, why do you keep wanting to study me? My life just isn't that interesting. The Harvard men never ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> to get the clearest picture of these lives, we don't just send them questionnaires. We interview them in their living rooms. We get their medical records from their doctors. We draw their blood. We scan their brains. We talk to their children. We videotape them talking with their wives about their deepest concerns. And when, about a decade ago, we finally asked the wives if they would join us as members of the study, many of the women said, you know, it's about time. <laughs> so what did we learn? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives. Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us, and the loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High conflict marriages, for example, without much affection, turn out to be very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. And living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. 
Once we had followed our men all the way into their 80s, we wanted to look back at them at midlife and to see if we could predict who was going to grow into a happy, healthy octogenarian and who wasn't. And when we gathered together everything we knew about them at age 50, it wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. And good, close relationships seem to buffer us from some of the slings and arrows of getting old. Our most happily partnered men and women reported in their 80s that on the days when they had more physical pain, their moods stayed just as happy. But the people who were in unhappy relationships on the days when they reported more physical pain, it was magnified by more emotional pain. And the third big lesson that we learned about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protected. That the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. And those good relationships, they don't have to be smooth all the time. Some of our octogenarian couples could bicker with each other day in and day out. But as long as they felt that they could really count on the other when the going got tough, those arguments didn't take a toll on their memories. So, this message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being, this is wisdom that's as old as the hills. Why is it so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we really like is a quick fix, something we can get that will make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated and the the hard work of tending to family and friends, it's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong. It never ends. The people in our 75-year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. Just like the millennials in that recent survey, many of our men, when they were starting out as young adults, really believed that fame and wealth and high achievement were what they needed to go after to have a good life. But over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So what about you? Let's say you're 25 or you're 40 or you're 60. What might leaning into relationships even look like? Well, the possibilities are practically endless. It might be something as simple as replacing screen time with people time, or lightening up a stale relationship by doing something new together, long walks or date nights, or reaching out to that family member who you haven't spoken to in years, because those all too common family feuds take a terrible toll on the people who hold the grudges. I'd like to close with a quote from Mark Twain. More than a century ago, he was looking back on his life, and he wrote this. There is a time, so brief is life, for bickerings, apologies, heart burnings, callings to account, there is only time for loving, and but an instant, so to speak, for that. The good life is built with good relationships. Thank you. How much time so we can spend the class and disperse right there? I don't. I can't repeat the Mark Twain quote, but in case you were falling asleep. Or 
Well, I'll just put this all up so I can just talk about this. So maybe this is surprising, maybe it's not. Um, but a lot of times this is stuff that goes in someone's head when they take a class like this and then they go back out into the world and after their pursuits of whatever it is, <laughs> the work goals, fame of the house. My roommate Jeff, who was foreclosed, remember him? He took the deal and he became a, a very wealthy accountant. Uh, but he was also a very miserable human being for at least four decades. And he often talks about what it would be like to have that time back. And it, when he is older, is he going to regret that the fact that he spent decades miserable but making lots and lots and lots of money on the side? So well-being. What's important and what's not. Number one, and I'll fill in some blanks here. It's not all up there on the slides. Absolutely. So social connection turns out to be the really big reveal. This is the important thing. So connection to our family. It doesn't have to come from one area. I'm just trying to be very clear about that. It doesn't mean you have to get married. It doesn't even mean you're in a committed relationship. But in some way, some fashion, and it's unique for all of them, people who were healthy and happy were somehow connected socially. And the deeper those connections were, the healthier and the happier the individual was. What to add up there? Well, here's the key. One in five, so 20% at any given time, and I'm, I'm going to guess because of all the stuff that we've been through, this number is significantly higher right now, hopefully temporarily. But at least at any given time, 20% of people in this country are lonelier than they want to be. That's, that's the key, the want to be. Because what if you're someone who's an introvert and you're thinking, well, damn it, I don't want to have a lot. That's, that's perfectly fine. So the key is lonelier than you want to be. And at any given time, a lot of us feel that way. We're not as connected to others. The one thing that every time I've seen this always resonates we spend a lot of time worrying about things that are blood. I mean, for good reason. Not like you should just, like, you know, kill yourself or with eating horrible and not exercising. But we spend a god awful lot of time worrying about our blood pressure and cholesterol and how in shape we are, et cetera, et cetera. But the one factor, when they looked at all of the 80 year olds in the study, when they turned 80 and they looked back at age 50, the number one predicting variable of are you going to live longer and are you going to be healthier? Or as securely attached relationships. So it's the quality, the quality of these relationships. Satisfied at 50 led to a longer life at 80. And the key, I guess this, this is the analogy I can usually make that most people, I'm going to sound really old, so I was just about to say most people your age. I hope you've experienced this. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't yet, you will someday. But I guess the best analogy I can make for you is I guess usually in the beginning of a relationship, have you ever met someone or just had a relationship where at least for a maybe a small window of time, nothing else mattered? It wouldn't matter where you live. It wouldn't matter what's going on outside, what stressors are going on. But being with that person just makes you feel happy. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what kind of date you're on, whether you're at Cedar Point or you're at Sheets. You don't really give a crap because you just genuinely like being with this person. It doesn't matter. That's what he's talking about. These relationships, they're not, they don't have to be perfect. There's no such thing. But what they serve as, they're, they're buffers. Because no matter what, when you turn 85, when you turn 95, things are going to hurt. Things are going to fall apart. Even with Betty White, she's extremely happy. But you see how much trouble she had even getting down those steps? You're going to have bad days. And the reality of getting older is you're going to have more bad days than you have now. But if you're in a good quality relationship, those bad days aren't so bad because it doesn't matter because you're in this together. So it's the quality of those relationships. And then last but not least, these relationships even have an impact on our brains. People who are in these stable, secure relationships have memories that are sharper. They actually, to get a little more technical with the study, their cortex is thicker. So they, they actually show less brain degeneration. I think back in chapter five, we talked about the four major areas of the brain that naturally decline, our temporal lobe, our white matter. All those areas show less significant decline than people who are lonely. So 
So I guess we waited until the end of the course to talk about the big secret, living a happy life. And so I'm curious what your older individuals will say when you pick their brains about successful aging and what they see as important. I guess it depends on how old they are, what their experiences have been, but I, they're probably not going to say things like fame and fortune was exactly what made them happy or successful. Any questions? No? Well, that's pretty much it. There's, there's, there's nothing left. Really? Oh, we did it. <laughs> nothing left. Anybody graduating? Let's go. You're graduating. Of course. I know. Remember the first you day? Tried. You're graduating? I don't know if I realized that or not. I, mean, I know you told me. I don't do the senior research stuff, so don't see. Anybody else? What are you guys doing? Oh, you're graduating? What are you What are you doing when you're done? I know you, so you're grad school. Where? I'm going back my master's. Where are you going to go? Oh, here. Go, here. Cool. See you, Vincent. Anybody else? What are you guys doing? Getting a job at the hospital. I don't think we get my diploma until August, so I'll just be a DQ till then, and then I'll be fun. Very nice. Are you going to anything fun? I live vicariously through younger people. Also. Going to Virginia Beach. That's, that's, that's our big JK. I don't know why I said that. People don't. It's a vacation. That's about it. All right. Well, I'm done. Uh, don't forget to take the final exam. It'll be out there. Um, every ending to the class this year has felt very awkward. And just very like, a, like it shouldn't. I, I know it's done, but it's like. Something just feels off, and I think the off thing is we're not coming back for a final exam and, and saying goodbye. We're just sort of, I don't know, remember, remember matriculation, convocation? Remember that? And you assigned the books, and then you just kind of dispersed symbolically. That's what this whole semester has felt like. I feel like we just kind of hung out together for a few weeks, and now we're just kind of leaving. Like, okay, see ya. All right, well, I don't see you. Have a good summer. I'll be around. I'm not going anywhere. You can really leave now. Or you can hang out. Whatever. Oh, yeah. Yes. I'm sure I was thinking about the energy that I was thinking about. I have one person right now. I remember she has severe dementia. And she thinks I'm her father. Well, that could make for an interesting interview. It would. It would.